With earnings season upon us, it's time to look into three final analyst reports to round out our snapshot of how Wall Street is perceiving Rocket Lab prior to the release of their Q2 results. We have BTIG modeling out to 2028, including everything from revenue to adjusted EBITDA, though falling short of providing a price target. Morgan Stanley, limited with their modeling, but ultimately showing a reduction on the price target and base case range, largely citing the neutron delays as the crux behind their reaction. And last but not least, we have TD modeling only as far as 2025, although they provide a simple valuation method for their price target. In this video, we're going to take these three analyst reports and we're going to compare their modeling and the price targets to what we've gone over previously. Now, if you haven't watched the previous overviews, it's no big deal. I'll be sure to be nice and clear along the way to make sure that everything makes sense for you, the viewer. If you are interested in watching these videos in sequential order, however, I'll be sure to post links in the description below. Um, important to mention as well is that the slides that we're going over in today's video, these no longer include the in-house numbers that are being brought in from the valuation model. The reason that they've been taken out is because there have been a lot of updates and rather than trying to compare the analyst reports and also on the sidelines be trying to explain all of the changes that have been made, I wanted to give each of their videos their own breathing room, so to speak. So um, stay tuned for that one. That'll probably coincide with the Q2 release. I kind of want to wait. There's a couple more things that I'm waiting to make sense of and there's going to be some big changes and I mean, it's going to be a big video, right? It's, it's not going to be the quickest video out after earnings, I guarantee that, but it will absolutely be the most thorough. So you're in the right place. Stay tuned. And uh, if you're not already, be sure to subscribe. So with that out of the way, let's get into it. I want to make a point. All of these are very straightforward of what to expect. B of A Securities, BTIG, Cantor Fitzgerald, etc. We do have one that is simply titled Redacted. This is pretty much exactly what you'd expect, but as I mentioned at the top of the video, I wanted to make sure everything's nice and clear. So Redacted is simply a valuation model that was sent to me that's a little bit more elaborate than what you'd see from these general releases from the rest of Wall Street. However, it was sent to me in confidentiality and I want to respect that. So we're going to just simply title this one Redacted. So starting with revenue, you can see that everyone is more or less within the same trajectory. We've got a couple that are a little more bearish or maybe don't quite go out as far as the rest. But all in all, the general consensus is that Rocket Lab will be around the $1.5 billion range by 2028. Similar as before, the general consensus would probably land around the, we'll call it, $800 to maybe $500 million mark for gross profit. As we travel down the income statement, you can see that this is where Wall Street starts to have their discrepancies. You can see that some of these are trending downwards, some are more or less correlating, and for whatever reason, Cantor Fitzgerald is expecting research and development to take a serious uptick in 2026. Now, whether this is for Rocket Lab's Constellation or maybe a larger rocket, honestly, I'm not quite sure what Cantor is expecting. Similarly, we have sales, general and administrative, more or less trending in the same direction, with Cantor being the odd man out, expecting a large uptick after 2026. Putting everything together so far brings us to operating income. You'll notice that Roth and TD Cowan are still the laggards being the most bearish. You can see that we're trending in a direction of what can probably be expected to be a range of $100 to $300 million by 2028. So after including interest expense, tax provision, and the like, we arrive at net income. Now you can see that there's a general story being told here, but of course there are the anomalies, Roth trending in a negative direction, B of A more or less meeting them there, and then also trending downward. But overall, you can expect us to land in the $100 to $250 million mark for 2028. So earnings per share, this is something that was explained in a previous video, so if you've heard this already once before, bear with me. But earnings per share more or less mimics the net income. The only difference is the relationship between the income and the share count, which we'll get to in a minute here. All in all, these are showing a similar pattern to what we just saw with net income, with a slight discrepancy being those shares outstanding. For EBITDA, it's important to mention that BTIG, Deutsche Bank, and TD Cohen are all using adjusted EBITDA. The rest are using just simply regular old EBITDA. The general consensus would land us around the $200 to $400 million mark for the end of the period. We're going to circle back to the earnings per share by looking at the number of shares outstanding. This is what we spoke about a minute ago. The earnings per share is heavily dependent on the number of shares outstanding. There are a number of institutions here 
that for whatever reason are expecting more or less stagnated shares outstanding growth. The reason that I believe this is faulty is because if we look at Rocket Lab's historic shares outstanding, we can see that stagnation in shares outstanding is very much not the case. This is heavily dependent on the metrics that we're going to look into next, that being stock-based compensation. So for this metric, there are only two reporting. There originally was a third, that being yours truly. But for this video, you can see that stock-based compensation is not expected to slow down anytime soon. So translating this is dilution of shares. Tying this in again to what we were talking a moment ago, more stock-based compensation equals more shares outstanding, and that is what's going to affect the earnings per share. And if you just have that stagnated growth that the rest of Wall Street seems to be expecting, you're ultimately going to land on a faulty expectation of what to expect for earnings per share. So again, while net income and earnings per share seem to be tied hand in hand, there is a lot more that you need to consider. That being said, let's move into our second last slide, capital expenditure. Another term for capital expenditure is purchases of property, equipment, and software. It's more or less exactly what it sounds like. So this is every time a building is bought, anytime a piece of machinery is bought, anytime, well, in this case, software is bought. A quick and easy way to think of this is purchases of infrastructure for the company. So manufacturing, software, machinery, etc. As you can see here, Goldman Sachs is expecting a tick upwards throughout 2026. However, I'm more in the camp of Cantor Fitzgerald and TD Cohen. CapEx is almost certainly going to trend downwards as the neutron spend winds down. However, maybe what Goldman Sachs is expecting is the Constellation build-out that could result in a lot more machinery, larger factories, maybe that's, that explains this uptick here. Either way, time will tell, and it'll be interesting to see which direction is actually traversed. Finally, we have free cash flow. You can see that a lot of the firms drop off a little bit early, with Redacted going all the way out to 2028, but I bet if we were to extrapolate these forward, the range that we land at is probably $100 to $300 million in free cash flow for 2028. Next up, let's get into the price targets. To kick things off, we have B of A Securities with a $10 price target. This is arrived at based on a mix of long-term discounted cash flow scenarios between now and 2035. Their discounted cash flow factors in a 14% discount rate and assigns a 33% probability to each of the three base, bull, and bear cases. BTIG, unfortunately, does not provide a price target, though they do state that they are neutral, and at the time of release, which was June 25th, Rocket Lab closed at $4.74. BTIG finds enterprise value to sales to be the most appropriate form of valuation. They go on to mention that enterprise values to sales has compressed to low to mid single digit multiple in line with where Rocket Lab's space peers are trading. Next up we have Cantor Fitzgerald with a $6 price target using a blended 2026 expected enterprise value to revenue and 2026 expected enterprise value to EBITDA relative valuation split 50-50 with a 1.5x premium then applied. For Deutsche Bank, we have a $10 price target found by using an 8x for enterprise value to sales for launch and a 6x enterprise value to sales for space systems. For Goldman Sachs, we have the lowest price target of the group of 4.5. Their 12-month price target is derived from targeting a 3.2x calendar year 2026 expected sales of $879 million, discounted back two years at a 12% discount rate. For KeyBank, we have $8, reflecting a 7.5x price to sales on a blended 2024 to 2025 expectations versus a historical range of 15 to 20x price to sales. For Morgan Stanley, we have them lowering their price target from $8 to $10, with a base case range of $6 to $15 versus a prior range of $8 to $25. Their valuation is arrived at using a two step discounted cash flow valuation with a terminal growth rate of 3%. For the low end of the base case range, this reflects a scenario in which Rocket Lab conducts 20 electron launches in 2025 and 22 in 2026, after which launches plateau at 24 in 2027 and 2028. Electron pricing also levels off in the scenario at 7.5 million per rocket as competitive pressures and additional launch capacity limits pricing upside. The low end of the range also factors in one neutron launch from 2026, two in 2027, 
and three in 2028. For the high end of their range at $15, this reflects a scenario in which Rocket Lab conducts around 25 electron launches in 2025, 29 in 2026, and plateaus at 35 in 2027 and 2028. The electron pricing in this scenario grows by a 4% CAGR between 2024 and 2028, and Electron realizes 55% gross margins in 2028. The high end of this range also factors in one neutron launch in 2025, three in 2026, five in 2027, and eight in 2028, with Neutron generating 50% gross margins in 2028. They go on to mention that in this scenario, they envision space systems revenue growing at a 46% CAGR between 2023 and 2028, with gross margins expanding from roughly 29% in 2024 to 56% in 2028. Past this, it's also worth mentioning that Morgan Stanley is expecting both adjusted EBITDA and free cash flow to break even in 2026. For Redacted, we have an $8 price target that also uses a two-step discounted cash flow valuation, arriving at a 12-month forward equity value of $8 per share. They are also using a terminal growth rate of roughly 3%. For Roth, we have a $7 price target, and this represents a calendar year of 2025 enterprise value to sales multiple of 7x, which is a slight premium versus the overall technology peers' calendar year 2025 average of 5x. Finally, we have TD Cohen with an $8 price target, which is an 8x over the expected sales for 2024. So in closing, the range of these price targets is between $4.50 and $10, with an average of 7.45. Now, at the time of filming, Rocket Lab is currently trading at $5.65, so this marks a 32% upside. And given that Rocket Lab's been on a bit of a bull run lately, I mean, another 32% doesn't sound so bad to me. Do you think this is fair, though? Be sure to leave a comment below, and if you got value from the video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you for the hangout. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Have an awesome day. Peace.